Hi, Misha here, and I just felt like talking about clones again. I'm a clone. I know I'm fine. I'm one more on the way. So today we're going to look at the Black Series clones that I do have. I don't have even half of the ones they've put out. They've done like four dozen different ones now, maybe even more than that. And to be fair, most of them are just different paint jobs, different schemes. And that's awesome if you can see colors and things like that. But when you can't, I'm mostly concerned about different molds or features, accessories. So that's what I've tried to do. There's a couple of ones that ended up being duplicates because of different reasons. A couple of them came in sets or in bulk buys. But most are different in small ways. And that's okay because, well, they're literally clones. And as we've kind of been doing with more recent videos, part of this will be in-universe. Part of this will be just kind of my real world opinion and views. So we'll kind of split it up that way. And I'll be blending legends and quote-unquote canon together to give you my head canon, which is the best canon, at least to me. So before we dive in, if you could like, share, subscribe, and really most of all comment. I just I like comments. It's a lot of fun. And if you would like to help support the channel, we've had a Patreon for Misha Co for years and years now. So we're gonna kind of start off by looking at the more or less standard clones. And in this we're gonna include the ARC Troopers because their armor directly helped lead from phase one to phase two. After that we're going to look at more of the customized and specialized clones. Typically these were commanders, captains, other special officers, but also some clones that had unique duties like the pilots. And then we'll also of course talk about the commandos and their sub-variants and not really in any particular order. The clone story begins here with the original Phase 1 and the DC-15A blaster rifle. And it goes back with its origins really before the Battle of Naboo, 32 BBY, before the Battle of Yavin. Jedi Master sifo in prescience saw a combat, a conflict coming, and surreptitiously contracted with Kamino, the Kaminoans, to clone a million man or stronger army. He had been kicked off the Jedi Council, so this was definitely a rogue, off the books operation. Is, but before much could be done, he would unfortunately and mysteriously die. But his good friend, who would never betray him at all, Count Dooku, took over and actually picked the template for the clone. Why they only used one template instead of at least a few dozen, I do not know. But he chose, after an interesting competition, Jango Fett of Mandalore. And from that, the genetic template would be established for the entire clone army, the Grand Army of the Republic. They would slightly modify Django Fett's DNA. They would increase lung capacity, endurance. They would correct mild eyesight deficiencies, a couple of allergies, a few of the little genetic oopsies, you know, just trying to smooth it out. But generally they didn't do much more. Maybe, somewhat surprisingly, the clones were not sterile. They were capable and could and did reproduce. They considered making them eunuchs, but there were too many unforeseen consequences. The Kaminoans were not human, or human, really humanoid, so while they were excellent cloners, they weren't all that familiar with cloning humans, so they wanted to stick as close to the original as possible. After all, Jango Fett was selected, for a good reason. So the all clones would have his same hair color, eye color, 
skin color, and even height of about uh, 1.8 meters, about six foot, one, one and a half inches. This actually made it easier for them when they came to design equipment. Now, they would accelerate the growth. Instead of taking 18 years to 20 years to grow and train clones, it was nine to 10 years. Some of this would be flash training, but a lot of it would be holographic and or real world training on Camino, and clones would be trained from birth. Most would have a CT prefix. They would all have serial numbers, a prefix followed by digits. CT would just be your standard clone trooper. CC would be someone grown and raised to be a commander, but we'll get to that. So your standard troopers would be CTs, but they could be promoted and updated and through experience. And they would be essentially grazed and trained together in pods of 32. Which would actually make a lot of sense because they would typically be organized into squads of eight led by a sergeant typically with green markings when we were on the phase one so you have a group of anywhere from 36 in a complete platoon and a platoon would be led by a lieutenant lieutenant and he would be in blue Beyond that, you would get into commanders and captains. Commanders would have yellow slash kind of orangey yellow, and captains would have red. And they would command things up from uh, companies to battalions to regiments to legions to corps and so on and so forth. So it keeps going up typically in multiples of four, but there was some flexibility, especially when it came to officers and, you know, uh, support staff and, and all of that. And while clones would make up the lower ranking officers, typically generals would end up being Jedi. Although some Padawans and other lower Jedi would be commanders themselves. But I get ahead of myself. The clones are being trained in secret with support from Count Dooku. But, of course, the Republic would eventually find out about them in 22 BBY. Coincidentally, right as the first 200,000 or so were ready to go into combat. And they would quickly be deployed, at least the majority, 192,000 of them. The first battle of Geonosis to rescue a Jedi operation. And the majority would be standard troopers like this fellow here. Although there would be some specialists even from the beginning. And there would be another million almost ready to go and since this would be the beginning of the Clone Wars, more would be contracted with by the Kaminoans, by the Republic. Again, rather coincidentally, at the same time, the Senate had voted Chancellor Palpatine emergency powers, which would form the Grand Army of the Republic, commissioning these gentlemen here. The boys in white, clone troopers, clone soldiers. These were to be the tip of the spear. And while the Republic didn't have an army before this itself, its member states, planets, and regions did have their own defense forces and, and militaries. So these would work alongside those. All commandos, or excuse me, all clones really were in some ways specialized troops, special forces, which makes sense considering their template. But they would begin at Geonosis and they would continue fighting for nearly four years. With that, let's talk about their equipment, at least what they initially went to combat with, went to war with the armor, the guns, and more. From the armor to the weapon and even a lot of the equipment, the clone trooper, the standard one in white, which was just your typical private and 
corporal. Well, the stuff was made just for them and exclusively for Camino slash the Republic. One benefit of using the same exact body, the armor and the gun were both tailored to the fit genotype, so height and all that. The armor itself was designed on Camino before the war and was, yeah, designed for fit, but the Caminoans were not humans themselves, so there were pros and cons. And in a lot of ways, it was more hand-fitted, still mass-produced, but a lot of craftsmanship. They had nine years to make a million suits, so they took some time. It had a black undergarment body glove, which was, generally speaking, pressurized. And over it were 20 plastoid, plasteel plates, relatively lightweight but durable material, and they were held on with mag magnetic adhesion, meaning that they uh, could be removed and whatnot. But a lot of the stuff was in the helmet itself, and uh, this included a rangefinder could be built in, binoculars, they had a tracking device, communications systems, and even a small air supply because the original armor was vacuum rated if for a short time, 20 to 30 minutes, without an external O2 supply. It was also meant to protect against extreme heat and cold and chemical warfare, that kind of thing, and did quite a decent job at that. It could also resist glancing blaster bolts or direct kinetic impacts, but it was not capable of resisting a straight blaster hit that would burn through it. Part of that was simply the weight. You know, they had to have something that was still flexible and mobile enough compromises. There's not really much of a backpack, a very thin one, and as you can probably tell by the visor and even the helmet crest, this was very much based on Mandalorian armor, but whereas Mandalorian armor was individually tailored, crafted, and fitted to a, a Mandalorian themselves, this was, of course, mass-produced. So the heritage is there. What about the equipment itself? A utility belt with several pouches was standard. These could contain rations, small water supply, also a small med kit, very rudimentary with a little bit of Bacta and some synthetic flesh spray just to kind of keep a clone going or help treat a fellow clone until some medics could come along. There was a small rope or grappling hook device for light climbing or getting out of tough spots. Because there were some rations, there was also some sanitary wipes because what goes in must come out. They were on there. And a few other tools and small things that could just be, generally speaking, useful. But weight was a concern, so they didn't want to load the trooper down because weapons, well, they were kind of the whole point of a clone army. And the original main weapon was the DC-15A Heavy Blaster Rifle. This was made by Blaztec, so not Kaminoan, like the armor, but it was made exclusively for the Grand Army of the Republic, although it was based on some earlier designs. It's quite a large but capable weapon, about 1.3 meters long and nearly 4.5 kilograms in weight. Again, kind of relying on the FET genotype to be able to take it. It was quite long range, at least theoretically. It could shoot out to 10 kilometers and was uh, capable of taking several attachments. Interestingly, it also used magnetic cohesion to stick to the, uh, the glove so a clone wouldn't necessarily drop it if they had to. Like most blasters, it used Tabana gas. There was a cartridge in the buttstock portion and then an energy cell loaded from the side. The Tabana gas cartridge held up to 500 shots at low to medium power or 300 shots if put on high power. So quite a bit, which is good because it wasn't so easy to change out of the stock. But the energy pack only was good for about 50 rounds. 
but the good news there is it was easy to change out in the field and extra energy packs were carried with uh, each individual clone troop or at least half a dozen. So typically you'd be swapping out energy packs in the field and hopefully not your Tabana gas cartridge itself. The way these work, you would uh, put a small amount of gas into a chamber. It would be injected with energy, turning it into plasma. This in turn would go through a crystal and it would become a particle beam and it would be accelerated and focused using, again, magnetics through the barrel, which is why the long barrel is useful, and then, you know, would go out the thing. The gun could use single shot mode, which was good, give it long range accurate fire. And on high energy, it could blast a half meter hole in solid materials like Duracell or concrete. He could also be put at full auto fire which would reduce range and accuracy, and it would also lead to overheating. They did add cooling fins, vents, heat sinks onto the barrel to try to limit this, but still, it was not capable of really good sustained fire, otherwise it would get hot and accuracy would continue to drop. It could also be fitted with a scope, or be put with a tripod or bipod, and it could even take under barrel launchers for grenades and the clones themselves usually did carry a few different grenades they also carried a so-called droid popper emp and they usually carried at least one v1 thermal detonator sometimes more and that was what usually made up your standard clone trooper himself in his original issued kit in 22 bby but as I said, specialists were prescribed from the very beginning and would only expand throughout the Clone Wars. So the phase one was, yeah, just the beginning. So moving up the ladder, as if the regular clone trooper was not special enough, we have the elite clone commando with the prefix RC for Republic Commando, and then of course numbers. And whereas the standard clone would be raised and trained in groups of 32, these would be raised and trained in groups of four, a much smaller pod. And this would allow for unit cohesion. They were meant to be semi-autonomous groups of four with each member specializing in something. So a little bit different, and they are meant to be more independent behind enemy lines, strike operations, a rapid deployment, rescue force, that kind of thing. And they would receive specialized training. They would get some flash training, but they would get more live training. They would also be supervised by sergeants, the Kavadar. Most of these were Mandalorians. I believe there were 100 sergeants training commandos and 75, so three-fourths were Mandalorians, picked by Jango Fett himself. And these are the first clones to kind of have some individuality allowed and even encouraged. For example, they were allowed to pick nicknames for themselves, although they still had their official clone serial numbers. And they were also allowed to custom paint and even customize their armor. And they were allowed to kind of just individually train and express themselves more. And they would also be outfitted with a new type of armor itself for their mission. So it's one of the first armor variants seen in the war. Known as Katarn class commando armor, this is just simply a more expanded version. It has better, thicker armor, although it's a little heavier little better capabilities in the helmets and a backpack was made standard this was to carry extra ammunition for the blasters also grenades other gear and additional rations water and really equipment uniquely tailored for what each individual member would do so you have that. And when the first 
Battle of the Clone Wars, the first Battle of Geonosis, took place in 22 BBY. Five commando squadrons, so a total of 20, were ready to go. A little bit premature. Even though they had 200,000 standard clone troopers ready, the commandos were still really at the end of their training. They were taking a little more time. They still had rapid acceleration. But anyway, they were put into service at the first Battle of Geonosis and proved quite valuable at infiltrating a Confederacy, a Separatist ship. And the most famous would be, of course, Delta Force. So what about their weapons? Well, there were two standard. First, we have the DC-17 pistol. We'll talk about it more later, but it was really designed as a backup weapon for officers, both Republic and Commando and Clone. But it was actually quite powerful for its size and weight. It only held 50 shots in a standard charge, but they were pretty powerful shots for its relatively small size. And they would become widespread and see quite a bit of use with several groups. But the one thing most commonly identified with the clone commando is the DC-17M blaster. The interchangeable weapon system, or modular blaster, hence the M in the name, was designed by Blastech specifically to fulfill the need for the Republic commandos who would be sent behind enemy lines with limited, even maybe no intel, so they really couldn't customize what they would be taking into combat. Thus, they needed something that was portable and easily changed out in the field. And these would be built to a high standard with better quality control than the standard DC-15A, but they were of course based on it, just scaled down. And at the same time they even shared some internal components and small parts with the DC-17 pistol, which made interoperability better. The DC-17M had three original main configurations, beginning with the assault rifle or assault carbine. This is the smallest version, much more compact th than the DC-15A, but honestly pretty, pretty heavy for what it is. And basically the DC-15M was a standard chassis, but the magwell magazine and front part barrel assembly could be swapped out in the field, and other components for it could be carried in the backpack, spare magazines, energy packs, what have you. It too used to bond a gas, the same system, but the gas cartridge was easier to change out, and the energy cartridge held 60 shots rather than 50 for the 15A, and at least half a dozen spare cartridges were carried, sometimes more, if the person using them was, you know, going to use it as a primary assault rifle. Good range, Unlike the 15A, it was more capable during rapid fire mode and did not have a tendency to overheat. In general, it was better in cold, hot, moist environments, although it did have a somewhat higher maintenance schedule than the 15A, so it required a little more professionalism to use and operate. But with that, as a, as a given, it was a more reliable and versatile weapon. Again, it was made by Blastech specifically for the Grand Army of the Republic. And here we, of course, have a commando commander. One of the four members of the pod who would do command duties, as you would expect, and also communicate with the uh, larger army. Originally, 10,000 commandos were being trained, although more were produced as the war would go on. But again, this is a convertible weapons system. So, the next attachment was the marksman rifle. This gave a longer barrel assembly and an alternative magazine. 
It fired an interesting combination round. It had a metal core, or at least a solid core, surrounded by an energy bolt. This was done for better penetration and range. But because of the complexity, the magazine only held five cartridges, five rounds, but could be changed out easily in the field. And it did have an optical sight with 10 up to 20 power zoom, but it was not externally mounted. It actually linked wirelessly with the helmet and gave a display internally for the marksman. In fact, the helmet for the Qatar armor was quite advanced. It had fully integrated display with any weapon being used with the armor internally mounted but it did unveil one of the weak points because of its higher reliance on electronics the original mark I katarn armor was sometimes vulnerable to emp so mark ii armor introduced about six months into the war would uh, be more hardened against emp blasts and bursts but yeah the dmr version could be mounted of course the same blaster could be converted into an assault rifle and the spare parts would be housed in the backpack when needed the third configuration gave an alternative barrel assembly and side mount to turn this into an anti-armor projector sometimes nicknamed an rpg well while the range was relatively short and the rounds themselves quite expensive which is why most commandos carried only four typically on external packs it was very capable of breaching a lot of things and blowing up armor and what have you so even though it was an expensive shot if you didn't miss it was actually well worth its expenses and again, the same blaster could be converted back into an assault weapon. Or you could store extra grenades in the backpack. In fact, the backpack was very modular and customizable. The armor itself, like I said, the Katarn armor was quite improved from phase one. Some even considered it only second to the original Mandalorian Besker armor. Unlike the original Phase 1 armor, it could take a direct hit from a blaster, doing damage of course, but it could usually survive one. It could even protect the wearer from some fall damage. Just depends. So, more expanded. It was heavier, and since it was essentially custom built on Kamino, it was more expensive. But again, much smaller numbers of troops, and as we already talked about, the helmet was more advanced and more computerized. And like this member here, we had a commander, we had a long-range marksman, and we have a demolitions explosion expert who often carry sabotage gear in his backpack, giving the team some versatility. Although, the fourth member typically was not meant for direct combat as his primary specialty. Because the Clone Wars era battlefield was a very technical one, the fourth member of the team was technical. Repairing gear, sabotaging enemy gear, hacking into computers. Although he still carried a DC-17M, typically he would be relying on his other gadgets in the backpack and would also have the long-range communications equipment installed in his helmet making it a little specialized this could also double as a detonator or other remote activator should also point out that the backpack wasn't just there to carry gear for blowing things up or recharging your blaster it could carry an extra oxygen tank extended rations and water 
for long missions or even more expansive medical supplies. While each clone always carried the standard med kit, a more advanced one could be put in the backpack if necessary. Very flexible, like I said. And all members would have the DC-17M, but would often employ it in different ways, and they were also allowed to carry non-regulation weapons besides. And they were a very effective fighting force, especially as we move from the Mark II to the Mark III armor, introduced a couple of years into the war. This had yet more compatibility with weapons, including newer versions of the DC-17M, uh, for example, an attachment giving a uh, stun mode for riot control was added, as well as different warheads for the anti-armor RPG. So you see more and more expansions, but the, the Catan Armor Mark III was kind of the ultimate culmination, better protection, better compatibility, but was rather expensive to make. And while it was good, some considered it heavy, some considered the joints to be a weak point, and some honestly considered it to be a little stiff and ungainly. After all, like the Phase One armor, it was designed before the war. So, mostly good, but a few shortcomings were noticed. And here's the complete commando pod, or squad. Each one providing an individual role, although they were cross-trained for other duties. These were also kind of the first step where the clones started to really adopt interest in Mandalorian culture and traits. All clones had a passing interest in it because of their heritage, but because these were trained by Mandalor Mandalorian sergeants, and because they were allowed more flexibility and individuality, and they were simply just trained in smaller groups, we do see them adopt more Mandalorian habits, words, even manners of dress and honor code. And as we move up the ranks, we'll just see more and more of that. Well, the commando was very effective, but they operated in squads of four, typically independent from the standard clone, typically independent of the standard clone army, Sometimes not even reporting up the chain of command, but rather directly to the Jedi High Council if they had been sent on specialized missions. Others would work in conjunction with, for example, the 501st. It just depended. They were quite flexible for the most part. But there is another level of specialization and independence as we move up to. So we've covered the standard clone trooper, your regular grunt, corporal, sergeant, lieutenant. We've also talked about the specialized commandos, born and raised to operate in special operations units of four. But next up is a group that was really pushed for by Jango Fett himself, a special corps that could operate independently, was really capable of more independent thought and creativeness and just could work on their own or could lead other groups of standard clones. The Advanced Reconnaissance Commando, the ARC Trooper. And since it was kind of his idea, Jango Fett would actually train the original ones, and there would be a test batch of 12 produced, known as the Null ARC Troopers, although only six would actually survive. And what they did, they tried to promote individuality, creative thinking. They kind of removed some of the, the I guess, inhibitions <laughs> of the standard trooper, while they still tried to emphasize loyalty to the Jedi, and above all, to the Republic. While the Null Troopers weren't successful, they showed the way for what were known as the Alpha series of ARC Trooper, which had some genetic modifications, improvements, and they would clone 100 of these. And they would actually be trained before the war, 
primarily by Jango Fett, but also other Mandalorians helped. And then they were put into uh, cryo sleep until they would be needed. And in some ways they were standard, in some ways they were quite unique. And also they helped develop clone equipment and tactics. They had yet more connection to Mandalorian traditions than even the commandos, including usually adopting pauldrons and commas for their outfits, other decorative things. They also carried straps and bandoliers for additional ammunition and equipment. They had quite a few pouches. A backpack would become standard gear, not quite as large as the one for the commandos, but more for survival than uh, anything else. And they also used an improved version of the Phase 1 helmet, and most of them had a folding range finder. Again, based on Mandalorian aesthetics. The ridge on top, which housed some electronics gear, was somewhat shrunk down. The armor was pretty standard, but had a few things for durability. But it did lead the way. As far as their weapons, they would carry the standard DC-15A rifle and the DC-17 pistol. But where they varied from the regular trooper, they were trained on a wide range of other weapons. Mandalorian weapons, as well as CIS weapons, as well as third-party weapons. So while they were typically put into the field with uh, standard guns, they could operate pretty much anything. They were also trained on some vehicles, including the Bark Speeder, B-A-R-C, and Many could even fly the lot gunship and troop transport. Again, they were often sent out solo behind enemy lines, or they were sent out to command a small group of other clones. Typically, the standard rank of a ARC trooper would start off as a lieutenant, so someone who would command a couple of dozen regular clones, although you'll also see captains as here who would command around 140 to 150 clones. So relatively small group units. And it's here we really see their uh, influence on the clones in the way the war would be conducted. Now, they were not used at the Battle of Geonosis. They were still in storage. Rather, they would be taken out about two months later in 22 BBY when the CIS tried to assault the Camino, so the Alpha series would be used to defend their home planet. And since Django Fett was no longer with the Republic at this time, some of the Alpha series who had been trained by him would be called upon to train the next generation of ARC troopers. And while the Alpha series had a few genetic modifications, later ARC troopers would be either selected during their childhood, during training, or they could be standard clone troopers who showed exceptional thinking, valor on the battlefield. They could be promoted ARC troopers. This would especially become the case about 21 BBY and onwards. So the traditions were handed down generation after generation, and art troopers became quite diverse, which is very fitting considering their uh, you know, position of independence. But here we have the original art trooper in his original Phase 1 outfit. Typically, the helmets and the strap systems are endemic of this generation. But we have many more clones to cover. Drawing upon lessons learned and research from the use of the Phase 1 armor and experiences with the Katarn Kim, uh, me, Commando, and the ARC Troopers Specialized Armor, kind of all of these things led to the introduction of so-called Phase 2 clone armor 
as early as 21 BBY, although it would take roughly two years to switch the Grand Army over entirely. I mean, millions of clones after all. And the Phase 2 had several improvements, but also maybe a few um, degrade, uh, downgrades from Phase 1. At first it might look the same, except a little bit different helmet, but a lot of the changes were under the hood. It was still with a undergarment, a body glove, and then 20 plates held on with magnetic constrictors. But it was actually made lighter weight, and it was made more durable. It could take more of a direct hit than phase one armor. Not as good as Katarn armor, but you know, somewhere in between. Now, the phase one armor was crafted during peacetime. They had a lot of time to make it, so individual construction was quite good. And some clones appreciated this. Phase two armor was actually mass produced, still on Camino, but during wartime. Some clones thought this may meant that QC was could slip and they were more mass produced. They felt like the phase one was more like Mandalorian armor, whereas phase two is uh, you know, yeah, put out in large numbers. So there that's one consideration and one reason some clones hung on to it. Another the Phase 1 armor was pressurized with a small air supply. Phase 2 armor, while it had improved air filtration systems in the helmet, was not pressurized. So it could not go into vacuum as is, but on the other hand, it could take in outside air and refine it more for the uh, clone. So, yeah, pros and cons there. Backpacks were still not standardized. What we'll look at in a minute, one nice thing about the Phase 2 armor over the Phase 1, the Phase 1 was pretty much as it is. The Phase 2 was intended to be customized, kind of drawing upon, again, the lessons from the, the ARC Trooper armor. So they were more modular, they had more attachments for plugins. They also changed the color scheme. With Phase 1, colors denoted rank. With Phase 2, because of more independence and uh, names and more individuality with the clones, the markings denoted one's uh, legion or company, so the color was essentially that. And of course it could be subdivided into uh, companies and battalions and even platoons in some cases. And you'll see some Mandalorian elements, and we will see lots of customized gear appearing, and that's uh, pretty good. Makes them a more versatile force. Again, drawing upon Commando and Arc Trooper lessons. Much of the equipment was the same. I should point out that the boots were improved. They had the ability not only to magnetize, but also could generate a limited grav field to help operations. And they would carry a thermal detonator, a standard utility belt. And in some ways, the helmet contained more equipment and could support more accessories. And had a better vocalizer and better transmission radio system, both for clarity and for jamming resistance. The visor, the goggles were changed some. You kind of get away from the Mandalorian T-shape. And uh, you do have more polarized lenses, which is obviously beneficial. So more environmental flexibility compared to what we saw before. Again, just with lessons learned in the various battlefields these were being employed on. And around the same time as the Phase 2 started to appear, a new standard issue weapon would also come out. The DC-15S, the carbine, also made by Blastec. This was developed as a more compact, more versatile version of the DC-15A, of course, with some lessons plugged in from the DC-17M series. About the same size, but actually a little bit slimmer, but not near as uh, convertible. It 
featured a shorter barrel assembly, which gave it somewhat more limited range and accuracy. Had an underfolding shoulder stock, but the trade-off was it was better in full automatic fire, didn't overheat as much, and it still had semi-automatic, and they changed the firing system to one trigger pull, just depending on the long or short for the fire mode setting. Still fed with uh, energy cartridges, which could do 50 shots, and the Tabana gas cartridge was still up to about 500 on lower power settings, although it was much easier to change out than on the 15A. It was just a more compact and a much lighter weapon, and was, generally speaking, quite popular, although the 15A was still used for longer range shots and, generally speaking, appreciated for its higher power. So some clones and some units still found use for the A, and they served concurrently. And of course, the clone inside the suit was a little changed from before. As the war would carry on, more and more second and third generation clones would appear. Many of the original ones first fighting at Geonosis would eventually be killed, but some would be promoted either to commanders or to teachers. So much so that by the final year of the war, only about one-third of clones in the field were of the original batch. But with the improved armor and more flexible guns, and just to, generally speaking developing better tactics, the Grand Army of the Republic went from being rather stick, strict and uh, formal and kind of adhering to the program tactics from Camino to much more versatile, individual, and flexible and effective. After all, they were originally bred to fight a droid army, so if they were robotic themselves, it would not really do much good. But, like I said, there were ways to improve and customize and specialize the Phase Two armor, so now let's dive into those variants. First, I should point out that the ARC troopers themselves, who had originally fielded We'll call it phase 1.5 armor. Really a lot of the experimentation here would improve and be made into the phase two. And then that would come back to the art trooper armor. And we'll see a slightly updated and improved version, namely again with the helmet and the respirator, but also the pouch and strap system. But other elements of the uh, art trooper would stay the same, like the backpack and the uh, Mandalorian-inspired comma, and even the shoulder pauldrons. But at this time, we also see the clones themselves kind of customizing their own bodies. Different hairstyles, even tattoos, other embellishments were allowed, and in some cases even encouraged, especially with ARC troopers and commanders and other unique units. Well, the rank and file were still standardized. They were allowed a lot more autonomy than they would have been originally. So we see that here with the Phase 2 ARC Trooper armor and general setup. And these guys could carry the DC-15A, the DC-15S, or sometimes just the DC-17 pistol itself. For our first specialized role or environment trooper, let's talk about the clone jet trooper. Based on some earlier rocket trooper designs, well, some of these did operate in 22 BBY at Geonosis. It was really with the phase 2 armor that they were able to come into their own. They were fitted with JT-12 jetpacks originally, later on JT-12C, a specialized clone variant, very much based on the Mandalorian jetpack, or at least one of them. Obviously this wasn't meant for long duration flying, more of hopping around either to get into or out of sticky situations, and they more or less otherwise had standardized armor, 
although they could be fitted with uh, oxygen supplies if necessary. They were actually trained by Mandalorians on how to use the jetpack and they often just carried the DC-17 pistol because of its lightweight and ability to be holstered if they needed their hands and they also carried ordnance such as the rocket in their jetpack as well and sometimes thermal detonators and other grenades for demolitions. The DC-17, as I said earlier, was a powerful gun for its relatively compact size. It had 50 shots to a charge and was overbuilt and durable and used some of the same components as the larger weapons. Originally it was designed by Blastech as a secondary backup weapon, but yeah, some, including ARC troopers, as well as the jet troopers, found that it was a perfectly serviceable close, even somewhat medium range gun. And so is what they deployed with. But yeah, the jet trooper really gave flexibility and could operate in quite a wide range of environments from zero G, no atmosphere to moons and asteroids or even on full planets. But again, the, uh, the jet packs they used were only really intended for uh, a few seconds burn at a time and had somewhat limited fuel compared to uh, some others. A related specialist would be the clone pilot, or in some cases clone driver. Yet again there was a pilot in the phase one armor. Some of them even had alternative helmets with an open faceplate for better visibility. But when the Phase 2 came out and had no zero-g ability, something had to be done because around the same time, new fighters such as the V-Wing were coming out that did not have life support inside. So the solution was quite obvious. External life support in the suit itself, mainly the helmet and uh, a front box instead of a backpack because again, pilot. In addition, the pilots were picked during their childhood, during training, when certain clones were shown to have very good hand-eye coordination and just very fast reflexes. So while they weren't outright bred in their cylinders for being pilots, they were hand-selected and they could fly anything from shuttles to fighter craft and even help pilot freighters and frigates and cruisers if needs be. And they could even do certain ground craft like the A, T, T, E and other types. But they really liked to fly. That was their deal and they were picked for that. And uh, their armor is pretty similar with most of the change being in the helmet and their weapons. In a cockpit, if that's all they were doing, they would just usually carry the DC-17 sidearm, but they were often called upon to assist clone marines in boarding actions. So they would be issued a DC-15S carbine, makes perfect sense. So sometimes they would fly actions, let's say they were piloting in a shuttle, once the shuttle breached an enemy space station or ship, they would join their fellow clone marines in assaulting. And the marines themselves were pretty much standard phase twos, but with the space operations training kind of lumped in. And yeah, the pilots would join them. So these guys would routinely have weapons and were expected to operate on the ground or <laughs> on board a station or ship as well. Next up, we have two very closely related services. The ARF Trooper, not ARC, but ARF, Advanced Reconnaissance Force, which you know, had the reconnaissance part of an ARC Trooper, but without the commando part. And they were very closely related to the Scout Trooper, or Clone Scout. Pretty much the same thing. They would, well, scout ahead, 
re reconnoiter a battlefield beforehand, sometimes do sabotage missions, communicate deep within lines. The ARF Corps would often serve the Jedi on a planet directly, whereas the scout troopers were more attached to the clone army, the Grand Army of the Republic itself. So they had equipment to survive in an environment for a longer duration than normal, and they would also operate in small groups. They were often trained to drive vehicles as well, um, like the ATAP or the Burke speeder, small one or two men craft typically. And they would usually be issued with the DC-15A, although some would have the S because of longer range. And some would even have a variant known as the DC-15X marksman rifle or sniper rifle. And of course some would also carry pistols, but not all. Other specialized equipment would be a pair of electric binoculars. long-range communications and sensor equipment in the backpack and they would usually carry two thermal detonators instead of just one and on top of that they typically had silver based armor that could be painted to match their environment obviously here we have jungle woodland but other variants could do, uh, be for deserts snowy terrain and their armor was made slightly lighter and slightly more flexible than standard phase two for rather obvious reasons partially to help them drive vehicles and partially just for better movement and concealment in their scout reconnaissance roles and there will be small changes to the R farmer there was R phase one and R phase two as well Let's return to the ARC Trooper one more time to talk about some specialized variants. Specifically here we have a clandestine low light or night version. Also just meant for Hana Lines sabotage and stealth. Very much based on Katarn Class 3 or Mark 3 armor used by the commandos. It had improved low light abilities, night vision in the helmet, also better sensors for night use, and the armor itself was coated so as not to show up on scanners as readily. And they would sometimes carry the specialized DC-17M as well. And you start to see these towards the end of the war with the ARC troopers as they go into the outer rim sieges and try to break up the stronghold that the CIS had out there. And several other customized versions of ARC Troop armor exist, but this is pretty much the final type of production variant with the full Phase 2 improvements. And each soldier could definitely customize his armor by this point. And that's a good start, the jumping off point, to start talking about, well, the commanders. Trained from a young age for better leadership, coordination abilities, and better tactical thinking, more dynamic thinking, we have the clone commander. Whereas the standard clone had a CT prefix and the commando was RC, these received the designation CC. Typically would start off with the rank of captain and would be promoted to the rank of commander and maybe even beyond if they showed particular aptitude but typically those were the two ranks for the commander level officers in the clone army as it were. So they, they would begin their career be commanding a uh, company they could climb up a battalion, even up to a legion, even though this was typically under the command of a Jedi on paper, a lot of times the commander would be doing the job. They also adopted a more 
Mandalorian look with a comma and many had enhancements on their helmets, rangefinders, or other devices to help them control the battlefield better. And they had additional comms antennas to get back with the base. They typically carried DC-17 blasters, either single or in pairs, and would usually fit themselves with the DC-15S, but sometimes you can see them with the 15A as well. And they would really be the backbone, the heart of the Grand Army. They were the go-between between the Jedis and the average clones. And it uh, definitely showed. Commanders often customize their armor. One feature that you see with the Phase 2, again I said it was more modular, was a visor system. Also areas to attach more antennae, communications gear. And some, like Cody here, even had a compact short range, kind of short, limited ability, but still very lightweight jetpack. But as you see, it's not really inspired by the Mandalorian pattern. And it was really just there for emergencies or to get to his lieutenants very quickly on the battlefield if necessary. And this is from later in the war, really showing the amount of independence and flexibility being allowed at this point. Some clone commanders would even receive ARC trooper training, typically from the original Alpha ARC troopers. Kind of giving them a dual role as ARC trooper and company or battalion commander. They would have commas, typically carrying the pistols and having modified helmets to some degree. For example, here are the Fold down binoculars, shoulder pauldron, but not fully going to the ARC Trooper outfit because they were still more or less a commando, excuse me, a commander. And again, some would opt to use the longer range DC 15A even later on in the war. I think it's kind of interesting that. Originally, art troopers were specially bred, but later they were mostly promoted from those who showed the aptitude as combat went on. But again, combat's a very good proving ground. Alongside their men, some commanders, like Rex here, would don cold weather or other environmental gear to operate on various planets. The cold weather assault troopers typically had HT-77 cold weather armor, as well as heater energy packs and external garb to kind of keep the ice and the snow directly off the armor plating. And their weapons themselves would be modified to, uh, to function in the cooler weather. Also, better filtration to protect against the blinding white of the snow could be incorporated into the helmet and long-range binoculars were pretty common for cold weather troopers for the longer distances and it's better imaging contrasting and these guys tend to appear later on in the war again as the outer rim sieges continue and less and less hospitable planets are being assaulted versus defense which the uh, Grand Army was initially on but not every clone trooper was called upon for defending or assaulting a outworld planet in fact a special group was used right at home the Coruscant guard as they were officially known but often called clone shock troopers by the rest of us Rumors persist that these were actually grown illegally on one of the moons of Coruscant, but this has never been confirmed. Officially, they came from Kamino, and they were meant to be the last line of defense in case the CIS breached defenses and hit the core capital. And they were really there to replace the corrupt Senate 
and uh, Chancellor Guard units and to be more capable as well. That was their primary role on paper. In reality, they were often used as a police force to put down protests and uprisings in the streets of the capital and so were trained in less lethal and riot control and crowd dispersion and coercion. And for the fact that they were mostly used as guards, they usually retained the DC-15A. A little more impressive, it could also be used as a club. Otherwise, they just had a standard set of armor, except for a shoulder pauldron. And again, these would be mostly seen towards the end of the Clone Wars, and almost always on Coruscant, or at the very least, in the service of a senator or the chancellor if they were going off-world on a mission. They served as essentially personal security, private protection. But are one of the last specialized clone variants. All right, now let's compare the figures and really how the clone body or buck or mold has evolved over the years. It's been in the Black Series nearly 10 years now. And for one reason I really wanted to do this video, I have the, the newest clone, the Phase 2 that just came out. And of course I've got the original Phase 1 and Phase 2 that came out in the uh, Amazon 4-pack. And then a few I haven't shown you before that I found is like my Rex and all that. So... Yeah, how's it improved? Maybe it, maybe it's lost something. Well, let's look into it. Let's compare Phase Two Troopers since I have them in the three different styles: original 2014, the 2020, and the 2023. Barely, <laughs> the couple of figures that have been done with this style just made it in to at least the U.S. November, December of this year. So, yeah. Of course, yeah, these are all Phase 2. Well, except for the Shock Troop, but he's still close enough. The original clone body has been criticized by some for being rather stiff and not as easy to articulate. And I get it. I haven't really bent mine around a lot, but we do have kind of double jointed things pretty common for the black series at the time the knee pads and shoulder pads are pretty much just one piece of the outfit so there's the double joint you can see it kind of bowing it gives good flexibility but I always thought double jointed looked a little odd it's better on this with the knee pads but if on the regular figures having two knees I understand why they did it it's, it's it's a cuts thing but yeah and of course you have some waist this is all single piece swivel here here shoulder pads but they kind of bump into this and limit your movement there and you have a regular head this particular one is still stiff, but, you know, to someone who grew up with five points of articulation, five POA Star Wars figures, even this is kind of neat to me. And, of course, G.I. Joes were the first to really give us pretty good articulation in the three and three quarters, uh, three quarter scale. But yeah, that's the original, several variations of him. Here we have the first major update. The pads are actually separate pieces and we're no longer double jointed. But they're kind of cut in a way to move better. Some don't like that the pads are fixed, glued to the top piece. I mean, I guess you could break them free. 
because they are separate things you see this at least this does move the only downside to having a separate pattern I generally do like it is this could tear over time especially if you bend him a lot and the uh, the elbow ones are known for that he does have the joints that swivel front and back on the shoulders it, at first that might not seem like such a big deal but it actually really does let them hold a lot of stuff better just that little bit of movement in the shoulders really helps them get their guns together of course the hands are articulated typically you either get side to side or up and down depending on which figure this one's of course side to side but some newer ones we'll look at they've even gotten ball joints the head to me and it actually being the shock trooper really helps because you have this pauldron to me the head is a little more on a chicken neck not too bad I've seen more people complain about the shoulder pads being a little small the reason that they were made smaller was so they could fold up more and kind of slide under the piece better than the original they do bunch up though so not great like I said some do actually prefer the noticeably larger shoulder pads on the original but they are more limited this one they're a little bit smaller but a little more articulation waist is pretty well the same swivel down here I don't know if this one has a bicep swivel may not may just be here in the elbow not really something I play around with a lot. Yeah, I think this is what they did because the elbow doesn't bend on this one. It bends up on the higher. And with this one, it bends here instead of higher up. So it's your choice. I kind of like the elbow bend more. It's a little more natural. This was a. You know, some people like this one more. Some people don't. And never minded it. I was just happy to quote unquote see what a clone trooper looked like. Because while I had stormtroopers as a kid, by the time the prequels came out, I was too old for toys. <laughs> and finally our newest and presumably what will become the current body. You can see he really has an easy time holding his blaster. The articulation here is good. You actually have another swivel up here. So they moved it back. Seems like it's, oops, that was me, not him for once. Oh well. Still has the kind of bend up there. And the center, the chest piece is now flexible and moves around, which helps with articulation. And that should help with molds and you know making variations or customizations I, I, I do think that's neat just as i like where the shoulder and knee pads are separate it still does have articulation at the thigh i know some of the other newer ones aren't having that now like i've got the um cad bane the newest one and he doesn't have it the knee pads now aren't fixed they completely float around they're just they're on there you could spin them around so basically they're unglued and I didn't really mention the feet um, I guess I just don't focus on them much you know they've got some movement and pivot at least this one doesn't want to go side to side let me look at the other ones again not something I always play around with yeah, this one has tighter ratchets, but yeah, that could just be a figure variant. Yeah, none of these have the ankles that really... Yeah, this one's more limited, especially in the back position. Makes sense, though. In armor, you're not really going to twist your ankle. So, you know, that's kind of the excuse you can always make with any person in an armor. Even if it's meant to be flexible armor, is well, they can't move there because the armor... Now, when you have a, a person, it's a little harder. Same thing also goes with, like, the cuts and things. I do like these, though, because the sh the straps for the pads often hide the cuts and 
what have you. And of course this one has a removable helmet as a standard feature for the first time. We've had removable helmets, but they're usually on more named characters. Thermal detonator. All that good stuff. The mold for the DC-15S has changed slightly over the years. They've refined it just a little bit. I do like that the trigger finger works. Yeah, he has a second trigger finger on the new one. The other one, I don't believe. Yeah, he's just got a regular grippy hand. So a lot of people like that. You can dual wield these. And you can still have it hold things quite easily, as you saw with how I had him positioned in the other part of the video. He's fun. Most of these usually just come with uh, clones. Either come with the DC-15S only, or they come with the DC-15A and S together. Only a few just come with the long rifle. I like that. I wish more came with pistols, though. A little variation in accessories, as many clones as they've made, would be nice. But then again, they've made a lot of stormtroopers, and we don't see a lot of variation there. As to comparing Phase 2 and Phase 1 clones, aside from the different weapons we see in the films, it kind of surprised me that really the difference is the helmet. Maybe those in more know can point out some smaller detail differences on the outfits, but... Really, the helmet's the difference. The good news is it's at least a big difference. And of course, as I've talked about earlier, the markings, they go from color designating rank to color designating legion or regiment. So let's look at the 2014 and the 2020 phase one. I do like the long gun. It's, uh, it's a long gun for sure. This one's from the Amazon pack. So he has the same mold as what we already looked at. So the articulation is going to be the same. And this is really where not being able to hold it in two hands comes. Now, can you, you know, bend things around and force it? You can. But you're going to have something straining against something. So it's not essentially ideal. At least the finger does go in the trigger, though. I uh, do think the Phase 1 helmet's pretty cool. It's, it's really its own look, halfway between Mandalorian and Stormtrooper. Whereas the Phase 2 is getting very Stormtrooper-y. I can't really bend those in too much. You can go up a little bit. Back you can go a little more. But, yep. Like I said, this is the one from the Amazon pack, which I thought was a cool pack when it came out, frankly, to get all of the generations of Trooper in one. And the second version, he can definitely easily hold the blaster in several different ways in his hands. We've already talked about the things. Said to me, though, about the gap in the neck. Kind of a bigger gap. It does give it more mobility. You look at the first type, there's less of a gap there. On the Phase 2, because it's kind of, I don't know, a little bit bulkier, that bugs me. On the Phase 1, though, not as much. A little bit thinner armor look. I don't know. Same with the shoulder pads. But since I pretty much always put the long rifle with my Phase 1s, him being able to adequately hold it is good. My only grab about the clones, and this is probably just because in the films, it would have been nice to have a way to store the guns. Either a holster for the small blaster, or maybe a sling or a peg for the long one. We see that with other Black Series figures. I kind of like some of them stowage. We don't see as many Phase 1 clones. Now we do have a 2023 body one coming out next year. So that's pretty neat. And he'll have the removable helmet too. This guy still doesn't, of course. But no, I really I, I like the phase one. It's it's more unique. And of course, we have the in-betweens. We're out in between the phase ones from Attack of the Clones and the Phase Twos in uh, Revenge of the Sith and of course the Clone Wars. We have also from the original 
Tartakovsky, Clone Wars, the ARC Troopers. These really kind of delight me, and they really are an in-between. And the Jesse one is my recent pickup. But I did miss the Echo ARC Trooper. So my first one was actually the red one here, the Captain. Many call him Fordo. But I don't believe that was actually on the packaging. I think they just called him the Captain or even the Red ARC Trooper. So he was my first pickup, and I really like him. He does have storage for his pistols, two pistols, and he came with both large and small DC-15s. So he came with a total of four guns. He has a backpack, but it's not removable. That's okay. He's got a pauldron. He's got the comma, but it's made of plastic. Rubber, really. He's got gun belts or bandoliers. He's got his pouch on the front, on the uh, left side. He does have the newer articulation. Plus he's got a little rocket on his arm there. Let's check on the legs. Yeah, they seem to be the newer style too. No, I really like this figure and he came pretty loaded up. I'm one foot standing weird, but Oh well. Let you stand normal. Quit it. And I'll explain why I like him so much. Here's the recently released Art Trooper Jesse. Now he did not come with the DC-15S. I just borrowed one off someone else and put it on him because I thought he needed something. He does come with the two pistols. And he does have a removable helmet, which kind of surprised me when I took it off the first time and realized he's bald. I mean, I didn't know Jesse was bald. How would I know? <laughs> and notice his pouch is on his right side now. And I really do like that this is a Phase 2 art trooper, complete with the Phase 2 style helmet. Meaning that Fordo here, Captain, is in the Phase 1. And I don't know how many other Phase 1s we really got. Let me know. But he's the only one I've got, and I think that's neat being special. I like generational changes. It it just, yeah, I knew I was going to do that. Oh, well. It makes me happy. Difference there, difference in the goggles. Of course, they both have the visor. I know some don't like it because the Jesse has this and has the fin, but I don't know that in all media he doesn't have this. I almost wonder if he didn't have the fin as an error in the animation. Either way, he's an art trooper. He's a Gen 2. I think that's neat. My only grump with him is I wish he did come with at least the one blaster because Fordo came with four. He comes with just two. Yes, you get the removable helmet. That's neat, but I don't know. Little something else wouldn't hurt because we've got a lot of these guys now. I think uh, what, there's fives. There's also art trooper style. Having something to distinguish them is a good thing. Of course, we also have the Umbra operative here, the night operations one. I originally picked him up to get a Generation 2 art trooper, since again I missed Echo, and this was long before Jesse and Fives came out. I still like him. He's pretty much the same mold except a fixed helmet, and he only came with the two blasters too, so I gave him a DC 17M, just for fun. I think he was from the Gaming Greats line, so they sometimes be our little skinnier on accessories. But there and again, I kind of wish we got a little something more with him. But then again, I don't really think I'd want another DC 15S. I've got enough of those, so if they weren't going to include something special, that's okay. But I do like it that we do have both generations of ARC Troopers. Makes me happy. And this gives me a nice lineup, and he, he's just a special ops guy. Why not? Speaking of the gaming greats, Delta Squad, Clone Commandos. Some think they're too small, but it doesn't bug me. I'd rather have kind of uniformity, conformity. So I like the fact that they kind of fit in with the other clones and Clone Force 99. 
and really the the releases get better and better started off with boss who's fine you do have the larger shoulder pads you have the unique helmet the backpack comes with the DC-17M, but that's really about it. Oh, and the larger kind of thigh pads. Like he, He's on the hunter body, of course, which we've seen a lot of. I don't know, I just kind of feel like he needs a little more. I do find it kind of interesting that these guys don't have belts. Utility belts. They have backpacks, I know. So I put a, a pistol on him, just for fun. I figured a commander would carry a pistol. And since these are kind of non- standard troops carrying non-reg gear and weapons would make sense but i do yeah i do kind of wish that they had belts or something but they're part of the gaming greats line so yeah you kind of get what you get some have also complained that the uh the gun is undersized i don't think so i think it's kind of an optical illusion you see that a lot i think for what it is it actually scales well with the figure but it's just because they're so small a lot of times things are actually intentionally oversized and that's how they look proper to people because it's just how shrinking down goes but yeah he was fine but i think a lot of people when he first came out they weren't sure if they were going to do the whole delta squad and by himself he's a little underwhelming just um just kind of a repurposed hunter Next we have Fixer here. He came with the same blaster, but he does have a unique backpack. Well, at least a modified version. He also has a unique helmet. Little thing there. And I gave him the little tracking fob from the Mandalorian. I just thought kind of looked good in his hands this is maybe a detonator or something a scanner i don't know i kind of wish he did come with i, I like the, the tech figure from bad batch because he just has all the gobbledygook and i kind of wish they did that more with him so gonna be honest he's probably my least favorite i don't mind boss because he's just hey standard commando and i don't hate this guy at all i just I feel like he really needed something more than just a special backpack and a new helmet attachment. It's still neat, though. I'm glad they at least did that. And now we have two in the line. Next up, Sev. Pretty well standard helmet. Pretty well standard backpack. Pretty standard figure. Except he has the sniper variant of the DC-17M. And when this came out, I thought it was pretty cool to get the alternative version and really no one else comes with this gun so that accessory right there kind of is cool i went ahead and gave him a holster too i figured a sniper would carry a pistol i don't know i've modified these a little bit just for fun just for myself same mold though but now the mold instead of kind of appearing lazy is actually working because Hey, this is what they look like in the line. At least they're all consistent with each other. And I do like that. That's just kind of how my personality goes. And of course, they each have different colorations. But uh, it doesn't matter much to me. So with three released, people were really, really going to be mad if they didn't release the fourth member. And not only do we get Scorch, last but not least... I think for most people, he's the best of the bunch. For one, we have the third and final configuration of the DC-17M, the RPG or anti-material launcher version. We also got this thigh piece strapped on that's his extra rounds for his launcher. And we got a new backpack. Or at least a modified version again. So he has three distinct unique parts. And that's cool for this series. Again, the Gaming Greats is meant to be a repurposed, redone series. And I had an extra, you know, Stormtrooper belt here. And I figured, well, if he's launching grenades, he might not have time to convert his rifle. So let's stuff a DC-15S in the scabbard here. 
seems like he would want to carry something because he only has three or four rounds for his uh, RPG. Uh, it should go without saying that I did not play the video game, but I do like commandos in general, and I do like kind of special forces and stuff. And frankly, I picked these up more or less out of boredom because it seems like whenever they came out and I could find them, there wasn't much else going on, and I, I do like the clones. Those and Mandalorians are probably my favorite sets in the Black series. And no, these don't disappoint me. And I think now that we have the complete team, most people aren't disappointed either. Might as well keep on with the gaming grades. The Jet Trooper. Jump Trooper, if you prefer. He's neat. And again, he's from the gaming grades, so expect what you get. He's a pretty well standard Phase 2 clone, original 2014 body. <clears throat> and he has a painted Mandalorian backpack. And of course, he's modified where it fits. It does fit well, though. I'll give it credit. It really does. No moving parts on this one. And he just comes with a DC-17M pistol. On the one hand, I'm, I'm glad someone came with a pistol. I really wish he had a holster. It really would make sense, because they did have quick draw holsters. And he really could use one. Also, some of these seem to have a type of rocket launcher or, or pulse or ordnance launcher, a bigger gun. Would have been kind of cool to see him come with that. So, either or. I would have liked a, a holster for his pistol or a bigger gun, too. But I wouldn't want to give up the pistol, because we get so few of these, except at, you know, the commanders and ARC troopers. But they have holsters, so they usually keep them. But it's cool to have a jet trooper, and the Mandalorian connection is neat. The other thing is, I kind of wish there was a little more, like a different helmet. Because if you look at this, the um, Stormtrooper that flies around, he has a pretty cool helmet pack and everything with hoses and stuff. Then again, I just kind of like hoses. That's why I like this guy. The Clone Pilot, specifically Hawk. I believe this was a Walmart release back about three years ago. And I like him quite a bit pretty well standard phase 2 clone comes with just the DC 15s he's another one I think would have been neat I don't want him to come with the long rifle but I think the pistol would have been neat with him too but the helmet is just cool um, very clone like also very tie fighter pilot like and it has a full box and everything I, I just think he's cool. I've, ever since I was a kid, little kid, I like hoses and stuff, you know, respirators, and I love scuba gears. I had a uh, scuba diver toy that I called Jacques Cousteau. He wasn't meant to be Jacques Cousteau, so that's what I named him. But, uh, I don't know, I just like the look. I would have loved this figure as a kid. I love it now. It's a small thing, but I like pilots, I like ships. I mean, it would be cool if we had ended up with a to-scale v-wing for him but that's yeah not not happening other than that though it, it's neat that we at least got a pilot even if he was a bit of a limited release and i don't blame him he's mostly a, a repurpose so but at least when he did get a new part it's a big new part but of course he is the older style body so me what is what it is I guess he would have been one of the last ones on this body because when he came out, they were starting to switch over to the new 2020 body. I still wouldn't pass him up if I found one, though. For, you know, normal price. I, would, I wouldn't play a heavy price. Mostly just because, yeah, it doesn't come with any accessories except one. I do like me some accessories. And that's why I like Commander Gree here. He's the only one that comes with these binoculars I ended up using a little bit of uh, twine to put it on his leg because I always were falling out of his hands not crazy but I didn't want to lose them I do wish there was again a place to clip them I do like that on a lot of the other black series there's a clip or something on them and I do like that he's got this unique backpack with the antenna and not one but two thermal detonators he's kind of unique And he's 
in a camo scheme, silver camo, which I'm sure looks neat. I always get a little thigh piece here too. I don't know if that's supposed to be a holster or a pouch. I almost want to say pouch because he didn't come with a uh, pistol. I thought since he's kind of a R for scout trooper, commander, reconnaissance, jungle, maybe having a longer range gun. I wish they had done a DC-15X sniper rifle for some of these. Because I don't, I like the 15A and S, but they do get a little old after a while. So, yeah. But I really like this guy. And I think he was another exclusive somewhere, I don't remember. But he's still pretty much on the old style body. Just a few modifications to make him into the commander on Kashyyyk. But they're enough to kind of set him apart. And yeah, with that, let's talk the other commanders. I have most of them, but not all. Kind of reminded me a lot of Gree. We have Cody here. He's got a good number of unique parts, too. The helmet, visor, the two antenna, the compact jetpack, the other antenna on each arm. So, I, they gave him a lot of extra stuff to make him identifiable as Cody. Now, mine's wiggly. He's always been that way. I don't know. It's just how it is. It's, it's at the things. Oddly, it doesn't really affect him standing. But, yeah. Again, the old body. And he just comes with the DC-15S. I, you know where I'm at on this. I, a pistol would have been cool, but honestly, an Obi-Wan lightsaber, even unignited, would be neat for him. Or a little Order 66 hologram you could put on him would be neat. He's a cool figure. I love that he has all the extra accessories, but since Cody's such a favorite, loading him down, I think, would have really pleased a lot of people. That said, they could have really gone less on him. I wouldn't mind if they would do a reissue of him on the newer body and maybe then include some stuff. Maybe then I can get one that's not as wobbly. Again, it's only this joint here. And it's funny because these stay together, so it's just this area. He's only one of the few that is actually loose. Um, most of mine are quite tight. I could put something in that joint. What's funny is when I got to move the joint, it's actually stiff. It's, it's really the connector in there where it's on the torso. No, I like Cody. You almost have to have him. But a little more would have been pretty cool for him. Next up, Wolf. Um, I like him a little bit better than Cody. For one, we have the holstered pistols. We have the cloth, comma. We have the different type of shoulder pad with the antenna. We have the range finder on the helmet. This is a bit of a different helmet look too. Down here at the grill. And of course he has, it is removable unlike Cody. That's a bit of a buzz cut. Kind of Bart Simpson-y to my mind. If I'm being honest, if I'm being honest the haircut seems a little dorky to me. But that's just me. And he is, again... The older original body, so a little stiff, but he is a unique commander and one that stayed in the show a long time. So, yeah. like I said, I like him slightly more than Cody, but I actually like Gree better than both of them. As we near the end, Commander Bly. This is an interesting figure. Has the kind of fold down binoculars interesting shoulder pauldron that's kind of asymmetrical we have this uh, bandolier here which we don't see a lot of on these figures the arm slash elbow articulation is improved on this guy showing a little bit better body in my opinion we had these pouches on his uh, waist here I like pouches and things two pistols. He actually came with 
four guns is two, but no, that as well, but uh, no removable helmet, but he got, again has the rangefinder and the uh, cloth comma. Interestingly, whereas the other one we looked at that was cloth was two pieces, this is more of a waistcoat, waistcoat, waistcoat type thing, single piece, so he's different. I like different. I like variation. He's not quite an ARC trooper in appearance, although in the show he was one. He's kind of halfway converted his armor to one. But he does seem to move a little better than the original, original body. Because we do have another interim body with our final commander. We had to end with Rex. No really other way to do it. Of course, this is the Bad Batch one. I know a lot of people prefer the original Rex. When did he come out? Around 2018? And he was a new body, or at least partially a new body. I know the arms are different from the original. This is really the first somewhat improvement to the clone body we see before the full step up in 2020. But it was only really used for the commanders and only some of those. I think only three or four figures use this. Under the kind of thing he's got here, it's actually two pieces. And we've got an inner and an outer with a, with a comma here. So it's two different pieces of cloth. And this one's well stitched on the inside. He's got his holster, pistols, belts. He even has kind of an arc style pouch on his right side. And I think it's interesting that he has both the binoculars and the rangefinder on his helmet. I know that's some, some it's not correct, but I think it's interesting, so I'll keep it. His helmet's removable. Mine's really tight, though. I'm not going to pull it off. Don't want to. And I actually like that he has this soft goods kind of cloak or cape. I know in the video I kind of said it was like the uh, the cold weather assault troopers. That's a bit of a stretch, but, you know, it'll it'll stand in for it. And I'm glad I actually picked him up when I did because now the original Rexes are going for over $100. And even these bad batch ones, people are asking $60 or $70 for. He's cool. He's not that cool. But I picked him up for the regular price. And for that, you got to have a Rex in your collection. At least I would think so. You can't be Rexless. And he's a pretty neat figure besides. You get two different types of soft goods. He comes with three guns, removable helmet two points of articulation on the helmet better mobility than before although maybe not as good as we'll get with some of the 2023s if they ever reissue the commanders and the new bold but certainly a step up from 2014 at least that's what i think what do you think and those are my clones and we end as always kind of where we begin that's my Thoughts, opinions, musings. <laughs> what are yours? What's your favorite look? Do you like the phase one or the phase two more? Do you like arc troopers or do you like clone commandos? Let me know. And of the commanders that I have, uh, what's your kind of favorite commander look? With the comma, the pauldrons, maybe more stripped down like Gree? I don't know. Let me know. Just talking clones. But yeah, like I said at the beginning, comments are fun, so please do share your thoughts, opinions. As always, I appreciate you hanging out and tuning in. These videos, I just kind of do them when I feel like it, you know, and what I'm feeling like talking about. I don't know what it is about winter, but it gets me more in a Star Wars mindset. Summer, I'm more in a Star Trek mindset. I have no explanation why. Oh well. <laughs> this is Misha. Catch you very soon.